Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here this day. As the psalmist said, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So may it be so for us. And as we begin, let's pray and seek our great God, asking him for his help on this, the Lord's day. Let's pray together. Our great God, we bless your name this morning. We say with the prophet of old, who is a God like you? Oh God, we are so thankful that you are our God and that besides you there is no other. We are thankful, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for your great love that you have set upon us, your people, even from before the foundation of the world. We're thankful that you marked us out for all eternity to come to know you in the fullness of time through the transforming power of the gospel. And we are grateful, Lord, that we have been made the recipients of so great a salvation. And we are thankful, Lord, that we are here this day as your redeemed, as your blood-bought ones through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Father, as we are gathered here this day, we are gathered with the express purpose to bless your name, to learn from you, to be instructed by you, to be helped through the word of God. And we pray, O oh God, that all of these things would be realized in our midst this day, and more importantly, in our hearts. God, we pray for our dear brother Jim, and we're asking, O oh God, that your anointing would be upon him by the Holy Spirit, that he would communicate your truth to us well, and that we, O oh God, would have receptive hearts and minds to the truths that we will consider from Scripture. O oh God, we pray that you would shut us up to your things. O oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to push out all distractions and to focus intently upon your truth. O oh God, might it run and have free course in our midst this day. Might you build us up in our most holy faith to the end that we will bless your name and be found walking in your things entirely. Give us grace, O oh God, help us from this early hour all the way to the end of the day till we exclaim our last amen. Be in our midst, O oh God. We pray and we ask all of these things in that glorious and exalted name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Brother Jim, please come. Most of you, if not all of you, will know Jim Dom. Uh, Jim is a longtime Reformed Baptist pastor who is continuing to minister in many places, even in his, quote, retirement. And we're thankful that we can have him here for the full uh, day to preach God's word to us. So, Brother Jim, please come and do that very thing. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good to see all of you. Uh, my wife and I don't get down here that often, but it's a, a great joy when we can. Unfortunately, Brenda's not with me today. She woke up this morning with a runny nose and a sore throat and did not sound good. Whatever she has, I don't have yet, but um, I regret that she's not with me today. But uh, in any case, it's a del delight to be with you. Thank you for the invitation to come and be here. I want you to imagine for a moment, if you will, that someone comes to you seeking advice. And the person that's coming to you seeking advice is a, a young Christian, a new believer, someone who hasn't been in the faith for very long. And this new believer comes to you as someone who has been in the way for a while, a mature, experienced Christian man or woman. This person comes to you seeking advice and they say to you, I want to live a life that pleases God. I want to live in a way that honors him. And I know that you've been in the way for a while. You've been walking with the Lord Jesus for a while. What do I need to prepare for? I want to, I'm serious about discipleship, following Christ faithfully. What do I need to get ready for? 
What can I expect to meet with in the future? What should I prepare for? What would you say to this person? Well, there isn't just one thing to prepare for, is there? You could make a whole list of things. There are many things that you might mention. You might talk to this person about temptation and the fact that you need to be firm in the face of temptation. You're going to face all kinds of difficulties in connection with temptation. You might warn them about that. You might talk to them about mortifying sin, putting sin to death in the pursuit of holiness. You might also talk about the importance of prayer and the, the great importance of repenting of your sins, confessing your sins, repenting of your sins to the Lord, keeping short accounts with God. That's certainly something to prepare for. You might talk about the tension described in Philippians chapter 1, where Paul said to depart and be with Christ is better. There's that tug, that desire to be with the Lord, and yet to remain on for your sakes is necessary. So we've all got business in this world, but we also have an eye on heaven. We're thinking about the future. And it's not always easy to hold that tension between those things. You might speak to that person about that. You might talk about the matter of vocational preparation. If you really want to be useful for, useful for the Lord, one important aspect of Christian living is to be prepared vocationally, to have a trade or a skill or a degree, to be employable, to be marketable, and to be able to support yourself and your family and to be able to give to the work of God. You might speak to them about that. You might talk about the determination to be sexually pure. How many have fallen before the sin of sexual temptation and fallen into immorality? I believe that that's right up high on the list of things to prepare for as a Christian. We've, all, we've known people that have failed in this regard. The Bible has many examples of people that have failed in this regard. So if you're serious about following Christ faithfully, you have to determine, I'm going to be a sexually pure man or woman. You might talk about the question of marriage um, and give some counsel about how to think about marriage and what to look for in a potential spouse. You might talk about the inevitability of suffering. You're going to suffer. You need to prepare for affliction and trouble and suffering. You might talk about the importance of biblical churchmanship, the, the great importance of becoming a vital part of a local church and placing yourself under a sound ministry. There are so many different things that we might uh, mention to someone like this. What would you say to this person? What should I be ready for? What should I prepare for? Would you tell them, prepare for disappointment? Get ready to be disappointed. Would that be on your list of things to tell this person? And if so, how would you say that to this person without unnecessarily discouraging him or her? You know, how, how would you relate that, communicate that to this person without sounding cynical and unbelieving, sounding like a, like a downer? Prepare for disappointment, the experience of disappointment. And if so, how should they prepare for it? What should they do? I personally believe that dealing with disappointment is right up there, if not in the top five, probably the top ten challenges of Christian living. It's not something we talk about. It's not something we think about very often. But, but if you think about it seriously, we're facing disappointment all the time in a variety of ways, a variety of circumstances, Without a doubt, facing disappointment, dealing effectively with disappointment is one of the greatest challenges of the Christian life. If you want to be faithful to Christ, if you want to honor him and glorify him, aim by the grace of God to cope effectively with the experience of disappointment. And this is a huge concern. This is our topic for today. You could think of today as being kind of a mini-series on dealing with disappointment. We're going to deal with some introductory things this morning and then in the morning worship examples, biblical examples of disappointment and then tonight, hopefully you will come back tonight, tonight we'll deal with biblical remedies for disappointment. This is our topic for today and this is a huge huge concern. Most assuredly, we will have to deal with disappointment in a variety of settings 
in a variety of circumstances. It's an unavoidable part of life in a fallen world, and it's a common cause of discouragement in the Christian life. And we all know what it is to be disappointed, don't we? An unexpected car report, repair. And they're usually not cheap. Or uh, maybe a dinner engagement you were looking forward to with, with friends had to be canceled, so you're disappointed. Or a spaghetti stain on a favorite blouse. Or a misbehaving child. There's all kinds of causes of disappointment, all sorts of things to be dis disappointed about. Life in a fallen world is full of disappointments. Some of those disappointments are easier to cope with than others. Some you can pass off in a matter of minutes and, and move on with, with your life. There are other things that are so severe, so, some disappointments that are so painful that you're, you're left scarred for life. You're never quite the same after you go through these things. They leave their mark on us. Some things leave us reeling for years to come. They leave us perhaps in a settled state of disappointment. You know, money problems. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt, I am so deep in debt and my income is so small, so meager, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to dig out from underneath this mountain of debt that I have. That's very discouraging, very disappointing. Or how about conditions in our nation, in our world? As we look about us, we see that overall, not just in our, our nation, but around the world, there is great, great ignorance about God and great ignorance about the scripture and great rebellion to God. We see the breakdown of our society all around us. We see the increase of lovelessness and hard-heartedness among people. It, here in our country, the, the political climate is toxic. It's, it's horrible. And when we look at the decisions and the actions of some of our political leaders, it grieves us. The evil practices and policies that they support we see a marked absence of truth in the public arena. And these things are disappointing to us. Personal tragedy may strike. Maybe you break a bone or you, you get the diagnosis. You have stage four pancreatic cancer. Tragedy of some kind strikes. You experience an accident or a fire in your home or a flood or some other kind of tragedy, unemployment, or illness, or injury, perhaps even death of a loved one, death of a friend, or a family member, a sibling, a parent, or a spouse, a child. That's disappointing. People are disappointed. Relationships go sour, and people sin against us. People let us down. Promises are broken. Trust is violated. People don't live up to our expectations. That is disappointing. And then there's all kinds of physical and mental afflictions and disorders. Migraines, arthritis, back problems, stomach problems, depression, or other mental issues. Some of those mental issues associated with the aging process. And then speaking of aging, what a great source of discouragement and disappointment this is as we get older and our physical body, our mental condition, the physical condition continues to decline. Then there's remaining sin. Remaining sin, besetting sin. We all have our area or areas of particular weakness. And we almost never cease to be amazed with, with the grip that this thing still has on me after all these years. And that is disappointing. Weight problems, anger management issues, pride, lust, fear, anxiety. And there are times we seem hopelessly weak against these things, just ensnared and so easily overcome by remaining sin, or maybe reigning sin, as the case may be. 
And then there's plans and dreams and goals. Desires that we have, things that we would like to see take place, things we'd like to work for. And these things are frustrated. Things don't work out as you'd planned or hoped. We find ourselves in places and situations you never imagined you would be. Have you ever said that to yourself? You're in a situation. I never thought I would be in this kind of a situation. And that's disappointing. Singleness can be disappointing. And I need to qualify this. I am not saying or implying that singleness is a, always a disappointing condition to be in. There are some believers who choose. It's a, it's a conscious choice. I choose to be single so that I might serve Christ better. But singleness can be disappointing when you don't feel like you have the gift of singleness and you want to be married, you want to have a family, and you look out, there's nobody even close to the horizon. That's disappointing. Childlessness is disappointing. Unconverted friends and loved ones bring disappointment. And then last on my short list here, this is a short list, last on my short list, but not least, is ourselves. We can be the, the greatest disappointment to ourselves. We bring the greatest disappointment. It's our fault. It's, we're, we're the cause of it. Life can be one long series of disappointments. And you live with these things every day. And you manage to push them aside and push them down. You get by. You keep pressing on. You don't talk to people about it. You know, when you're here at church, Hey, brother, how are you doing? What's going on these days? You, you, nobody says, well, you know, I've been really disappointed lately. We don't talk like that. We don't talk about our disappointment. But the fact is, you're disappointed. You expected better things. You didn't think things would turn out as they have. You know, you didn't think things would be this difficult, and you're disappointed. You're having a hard time. And Christians aren't supposed to be disappointed, at least not for very long. They're not supposed to be disappointed. They're not supposed to be dissatisfied people. They're supposed to be joyful and content. And deep down inside, all of us know as believers that if we are disappointed, we can't stay there for very long. We can't remain disappointed for very long because disappointment, if left unchecked, is positively destructive and harmful. Disappointment unchecked leaves one prone to things like discontentment, sinful anger, chronic bitterness, cynicism, unbelief, joylessness, prayerlessness, self-righteousness. Disappointment can make us self-righteous people. Self-pity, self-indulgent, passive. Disappointment unchecked leaves us with a lack of motivation. And many other things, it's all bad stuff. If unchecked, disappointment can become the mother of a whole lot of sins. Disappointment aims for the spiritual jugular vein. It aims to kill us if it has it, its way. If it's allowed to run its course and have its way with us, it's deadly. But the fact is, true Christians can be disappointed people, sometimes very disappointed people. There are professing Christians, perhaps you are one of these, or maybe you know someone like this, who in many ways are exemplary in their character. You wish you could take some of the good stuff that they have, package it up, and inject it into yourself so that you would have, have these same virtues and same character traits. But sometimes with those very people, a subtle sourness lies just underneath the surface. So many good qualities, so many good things, but there's a sourness just underneath the surface. A sourness rooted perhaps in unmortified disappointment. And you meet this person, it's not on the surface, it isn't readily noticeable, it's very subtle, but like the little foxes that spoil the vineyard or the dead flies 
that make the ointment stink. Some, their sourness spoils these other graces, these other character qualities. The sourness rooted in unsanctified disappointment. It spoils the aroma of an otherwise fragrant bouquet of Christian graces. Now, have I succeeded in thoroughly depressing you? <laughs> you didn't come to church for this, right? You came to church to get, to get some help, some strength, some encouragement, right? And have I succeeded in depressing you? I hope not. But I invite you to come along with me today on a journey. This little mini-series on disappointment. Because disappointment is a serious matter. It's far more common than we think. And it's a serious matter. It should not be made light of. We must face it square on. We can't afford to ignore it. And this isn't something that many people talk about, as I mentioned earlier. But we ought to talk about it. Because this is where many of us live from day to day. So we come, first of all, to the primary concern in this first session this morning. It's a simple question. What is disappointment? What is it? We need to be done by 1030. Is that right? Okay. What is disappointment? It's always good to define things. Disappointment is an emotional condition. It's an emotional frame, a disposition of heart and mind, a frame that results from a misalignment or a disconnect between two things, your expectations about something and your actual experience. Not the other way around, but this way. You expect something up here, this is your actual experience. And so this gap, this, this gulf, this disconnect between what you expect and what you experience results in a particular emotional, mental disposition that we call disappointment. When our experience falls short of our expectations, disappointment is a result. When in our judgment things are not as they ought to be, we're disappointed. We think something is really great, going to be really great, ought to be really great. We get there, we experience it. It isn't, we're disappointed. We look forward to something. Oh, this is going to be great. We get there, we experience it. It isn't so great, we're disappointed. Disappointment is a sadness, the distress the displeasure, the dismay that we feel when our plans don't work out or when our dreams aren't realized, our desires aren't fulfilled, our goals aren't achieved, our expectations aren't met. Disappointment is the result. It's the polar opposite of that welcome surprise and gladness that we feel when our expectations are exceeded how often are your expectations exceeded? Not as often as when they're not met. Things rarely go as we expect them to. And as we get older, we recognize this. We start out life, generally speaking, as a younger person. We have all kinds of idealism. As we get older, we recognize that we need to temper our idealism to be a little bit more realistic. And so we learn to do this. We learn to expect less so that we won't be so disappointed. Ah, but when our expectations are exceeded, ah, oh, how delightful it is. How happy we are. Disappointment's the opposite of that. You may not be as I am, but in business transactions, I am willing to pay more money if I get good service or better service. Now, you might not be like that, and of course, price isn't totally out of the picture. Price is impor important. But the really important thing for me isn't just the price, it's also getting the service, good service. There's a hardware store right near our house where we just moved in Massachusetts, and they have everything in that hardware store. This is a dying, a dying experience, a dying breed, hardware stores that are well. I'm not talking about a junky warehouse. I mean a really good hardware store. And, and there's a guy in this hardware store. He knows his stuff. He's always willing to help you out and wait on you. And he won't just try to sell you something expensive that you don't need. He will try to sell you something that you really need. It's suited for you, even if it costs less money. 
He's really a very helpful man. And you go out of there, I come out of the place. Man, I like this place. <laughs> this is great. I got the stuff I needed. He gave me some tips. Man, I really like this place. Disappointment is the polar opposite of that. You know what I'm talking about when your expectations are exceeded, how great it is? Disappointment is the opposite of that. When somebody goes above and beyond the call of duty, that is so encouraging. But disappointment is the opposite of that. Disappointment is the letdown that you feel when your experience doesn't measure up to your expectations. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12. Proverbs 13, verse 12. And there we read, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Now the first half of that proverb is always true. Doesn't matter what kind of hope you have, whether it's a good hope or even a, a sinful hope. Hope deferred, whatever you're hoping in, if that hope is deferred, it makes the heart sick. That's always true. The latter half of the proverb, however, is not always absolutely true. Not all desire of any kind is a tree of life. The fulfillment of some desires is death, right? Not life. A tree of life is only to be found in the fulfillment of pure, God-pleasing desires. Maybe there's someone here. And we can all ask ourselves this question. If you were to get what you really want, would it be good for you? What if you could have whatever you want? What if, in terms of a specific thing or things, a specific area, if you could get what you want and have what you want, would it really be good for you? It's a good thing God doesn't give us what we want because sometimes we don't have good desires. So a tree of life is to be found only in the fulfillment of pure God-pleasing desires. However, I would argue from the context, it's probable that Solomon here is speaking of the desire of the righteous or the hope of the righteous. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled, the desire of the righteous is a tree of life. And I would argue for that. If you drop down to verse 19, look at verse 19. Desire realized is sweet to the soul, but it's an abomination to fools to turn away from evil. So it seems in the context, Solomon isn't speaking in absolute terms. He's talking about the hopes and the desires of the righteous. So in verse 12, hope, the hope of the righteous deferred makes the heart sick, but the desire of the righteous fulfilled is a tree of life. So the basic idea here is that disappointment is an emotional frame resulting from unfulfilled expectations. Which brings us to a word about expectations. If you're thinking about disappointment, the topic of disappointment, you have to think about the matter of expectations. And as I've thought about this over a number of years, it's not as simple as you might think. The whole matter of expectations. Something has to be said about expectations. Because if we would deal effectively with disappointment, we must properly manage our expectations. If we fail to properly manage our expectations, then our attempts to cope effectively with disappointment are doomed to fail. So what can be said about the matter of expectations? Well, somebody might reason in this way. As sinful creatures, we have no right to expect anything from God except judgment. What do you think about that? Maybe that thought's crossed your mind. Maybe not. Listen to William J. What right to protection does a subject that has become rebellious? What right to wages has a servant that has run away from his master? See, he's really describing us. We're like servants that have run away from our, our master. We're, we're rebels. And, and what right to protection do we have? What right to, to wages do we have? 
As sinners, we had forfeited all expectations from God except a fearful looking for judgment and fire ind indignation, end quote. All right? And we agree with these words, but there's at least one exception. May we not expect God to keep his word. Even as sinful creatures, may we not expect God to keep his word. May we not expect the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness that God himself promises. And of course we may. We might further reason, as followers of Christ, we should be willing to forego our right to expect anything from others. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? We should be willing to forego our right to expect anything from others as followers of Christ. Self-denial and cross-bearing, right? And again, that's true at times, but it's not absolutely true. Again, listen to William J. Man has rights with regard to his fellow creatures. Children have rights with regard to parents. Subjects have rights with regard to sovereigns. A man has the right to enjoy the fruit of his labors. He has the right to worship the supreme being according to his conscience. End quote. Those are rights. Think of the Apostle Paul. On more than one occasion, when he was faced with beating and imprisonment, he asserted his rights as a Roman citizen. There are times when we can expect to assert our rights. It's right and good. The world cannot function properly if this were not the case. Now, yes, to be sure, at times, love will forego its rights. It does not seek its own, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love isn't selfish. It doesn't seek its own happiness exclusively, and it doesn't seek its own happiness at the expense or the injury of others. But there are times when love will insist on its rights. Listen to Albert Barnes, and this is his commentary uh, uh, on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, this expression, uh, love does not seek its own, this expression is not to be pressed as if Paul meant to teach that a man should not regard his own welfare at all, or to have no respect to his health, his property, his happiness, or his salvation. Every person is bound to pursue such a course of life as will ultimately secure his own salvation, but not simply or mainly that he may be happy. It is that he may thus glorify God his Savior, the great design his Maker had in view in his creation and redemption. If his happiness is the main thing or the leaning thing, it proves that he is supremely selfish. And selfishness is not religion. End quote. If we take seriously the call of Christ to cross-bearing and self-denial, we will not be quick to assert our rights. But that doesn't mean that we will never assert our rights. There are some circumstances where we ought to assert our rights. So my point is it's simply not true to say that we should never have expectations of God or others. It isn't necessarily wrong to have expectations. In fact, sometimes it's necessary to have them. Some of our expectations are little more than personal preferences. Well, this is the way I like things. This is the way I want things to be. And these we must not necessarily insist upon. Other expectations we have may concern moral matters or ethical matters. Things involving biblical principle, and those are expectations that we should not give up. It would be sinful, it would be irresponsible not to insist on these things. Wives expect their husbands to treat them lovingly and respectfully and kindly. It would be wrong for them not to expect that. They expect their minor children to obey them. It would be wrong for them not to. Grandkids may expect grandma and grandpa to bring a package of Skittles every time they come for a visit. Now that is an entitlement. That is not, that's a, not a reasonable expectation. That's a different matter. An entitlement. Entitlement is a belief 
that I deserve special treatment. I'm just entitled to this. This is something that I prefer. It's an expectation you don't have a right to. So some of our expectations are arbitrary, completely arbitrary, nothing more than entitlements that we presume to be our rights. You know, the right to have the job you want. Don't we assume that sometimes? The right to live where you want to. Well, I shouldn't have to live in that town or in that part of town. I should be able to live here, like it's your right. The right to have the health you want. The right to have the family you want, the number of children you want. Not just four, but I have two girls, two boys, not three girls and one boy. The right to have a church that has no difficulties or problems. You know, I should be able to go to church every week and just have, have a grand old time, 10, 20 years, just do that, and I, I shouldn't have to be putting up with problems in the church. It's my right. The right to have life without problems and difficulties. The right to be successful. I, I ought to be successful in my chosen field. Or the right to be attractive. Or the right to have your own way about certain things. To be able to eat the food you want. To be able to live in the house you want. But to have your own way in this thing or that thing. You say, well, well that's silly. A lot of these things are silly. We don't really have rights to those things. That's true. It is silly. But how often do we set our hearts on these very things? And then when we don't get them, we're disappointed. We're saddened. Or, or at least it's difficult for us. We might get over it, but it's difficult for us to deal with. No wonder we're disappointed. Because we have these expectations, things we set our hearts on. And God has never promised us these things. How about this one? If I do things in just the right way, if I do this thing or that thing in this way, the right way, that will be the outcome. Now, we might have reason to think that or hope that, but it doesn't always work out that way, right? The outcome doesn't always turn out the way we want. We can almost expect, well, because I did it the right way, that it should turn out in a good way. Some of our expectations are arbitrary. Others are right and reasonable. And it's so important for us to distinguish those two things. Expectations that are purely preferences, purely arbitrary, expectations that are right and reasonable. It's important to distinguish those two things. But in either case, in either case, when those expectations aren't met, disappointment is the result. You know, you might be disappointed because you didn't have the upbringing that you wish you had. You look at other people and you see the wonderful family life they had coming up. You didn't have that and you're disappointed about it. You didn't get the education that you'd hoped to get. You wish that you could have gone to school, maybe for a longer period of time and, and been trained, or maybe got a trade or something and, and, and had more time to prepare, but it didn't happen. Maybe you didn't have the parents that you would like for yourselves. Maybe you have a friend or some friends. Boy, their parents, they were great. Look at my parents, and man, what a bummer. My parents. You don't always have the privacy that you desire. Sometimes we don't always have the respect that we crave. Sometimes we're misunderstood. How many here like to be misunderstood? Oh, that's so frustrating. Especially when you're doing your level best to communicate and you're misunderstood. Sometimes we're not loved and accepted the way we'd like to be. We don't have the friends that we'd like to have. We're disappointed about that. We don't have control over our possessions. We don't have control over our circumstances or our future. Disappointment is part and parcel of the Christian life. It's really part and parcel of life in a fallen world, disappointment. And the fact is that you and I can do many of the right things in the right way in the right time for the right reasons, and things still don't turn out well. It doesn't exempt us from disappointment. Or it doesn't exempt us even from a sense of failure. 
Disappointment tests our belief in the sovereignty of God, doesn't it? Tests our belief in the providence of God. Is God really in control of the whole world and even the minute circumstances and details of my life? Is he really? Disappointment tests our faith. I did not have a midlife crisis. I had a later life crisis. Didn't happen midlife, it was later on. I was well into my 50s. Because things don't turn out the way we think they will. They don't turn out as we plan. And that's a good thing. It isn't an easy thing, but it's a good thing that things don't always turn out the way we plan. And the fact is we don't always do the right things in the right way in the right time for the right reasons. But even if we did, there are no guarantees of success as we define it. No guarantees that our expectations will be realized. And the Lord, in his wisdom, brings us into places and conditions that we would never have chosen for ourselves. So I conclude this morning with one simple observation. The observation is this. All disappointment is the result of sin. So think about this. All disappointment is a result of sin. Now I did not say that all disappointment is sinful. But all disappointment is the result of sin. Suppose your son breaks the law and goes to jail. Suppose your spouse maxes out the credit card. Suppose your husband gambles away the house. If you're not disappointed about those things, something is wrong. Because those things are disappointing, and they ought to be disappointing. They're just plain wrong. So not all disappointment is sinful. But without exception, all disappointment is a result of sin. So think about this. If there was no such thing as sin, there would be no such thing as disappointment of any kind. Every disappointment, without exception, can in some way be traced to sin. It's connected to sin. Because disappointment is altogether a fruit of the curse. It's a result of living in a fallen world. It is altogether a consequence of the defection and disobedience of our first parents. That's where it started. Adam and Eve, they were told by God not to eat that fruit. But they persuaded themselves, they convinced themselves of certain expectations. God is holding out on me and I can get something that God wouldn't give me. I can be better off. I'll be happier by disobeying God's commandment. And that became their expectation. Oh, the fruit looks so good. And if I eat that fruit in disobedience to God, I will be better off than I otherwise would be. And that became the expectation. And were they disappointed? Big disappointment. And every, that, that was the first disappointment. And every other disappointment after that in the history of the world, that every person, all the billions, billions of people that have had disappointment, every other disappointment of that started with that one. It all came from that one. See, Christians are realists. We don't go around thinking, oh, this world is so great. Life in this world is just, just wonderful. We never have delusions about having heaven on earth, paradise on earth. No. Because this is a fallen world. And it's a world marked by disappointment. Christians are realists. Some people don't think so. Some people think Christians are just fools living in fairy tale land. You know, they're reading this Bible. Everybody knows the Bible's full of contradictions. The Bible's not true. And Christians read that Bible, they believe that book. How absurd that is. And some people like to think they're more in touch with reality. Really? You're more in touch with reality than a Christian? Is that so? 
All right, well, well, how do you explain all the disappointment, all the sadness, all the trouble? Consistently, continually, trouble, sadness, sorrow, and disappointment in this world. How do you account for that? How do you explain that? And unless you're a Christian, you don't have an adequate explanation for that. Unless you believe this book, you don't have a proper, adequate explanation for all the sorrow and miseries in the world. Now who's in touch with reality? Christians are realists. Because we recognize we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's under the curse. A curse that is rooted in the rebellion of our race against God. We are a race of rebels against God. The fact that you don't want to admit that shows you're just a rebel against God because that's what he says. And he's right. And we live in this sin-cursed world because of our rebellion against God and God would be just in leaving it just that way, wouldn't he? Just leaving us to ourselves. And then in his way, in his time, bringing final judgment. The executioner, his hatchet comes down in his way. In his God would be completely just in doing that. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't leave us to ourselves. You know, there's no salvation for angels that rebelled. But there's salvation for humans that have rebelled. And God was pleased not to leave things that way. What, is, what has he done? Instead, what he's done is he sent his son into the world to be born of a woman. Can you imagine the infinite, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God, the infinite God becoming one of us? And he's born into the world. Why? So that he can live and die for sinful people. So that he can live the righteous life that they should have lived, but they couldn't live because they were too sinful. He lives the perfect life. And then at the end of that perfect life, he goes to the cross and dies the death. They deserve to die, but they won't, they won't die that death if they're looking to Jesus and trusting in Jesus. He died that death for them. He takes upon himself their sins. That's how much God loves these, these rebel humans. He gives his son to die for their sins. And Jesus provides them with a perfect righteousness. You don't have to be perfect. You're going to be holy if you're a Christian. But you don't have to be perfect. You can't be perfect. But there is one who is perfect. And this perfect one went to the cross and shed his blood and died under the wrath of God so that those who believe in him wouldn't have to. That's what God has done for these rebel human beings that defected against him, these traitors. God comes announcing amnesty for rebel humans. And after Jesus died, he went into the tomb for three days. He was raised from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of God and poured forth the Holy Spirit. And now he sends his servants into the world to proclaim the good news of the gospel, announcing that all who turn from their sins and trust in him will be acquitted. They will be forgiven and pardoned of all their sins. That's how wonderful this God is. Whoever believes in him has the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. That is good news. Do you need some good news? There's some good news. The mercy of God expressed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The promise that all who turn from their sins and trust in Christ will be forgiven. That is good news. So I close this session this morning. Are you trusting Jesus to save you from your sins? And you know whether you are or not, as you sit there, right now, I'm not asking you, do you hope to? Uh, maybe later you will. Or if you did in the past, no. Right now, are you trusting Jesus to save you from your sins? If not, why not? What is more important than that? What is it that's holding you back from trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Maybe it's a young person or an older person. Doesn't matter your age. If you're not trusting in Jesus, why aren't you trusting in Jesus? You ought to be trusting in him. Nothing is more important. Come to Christ. Right now you're under the sentence of death. Come to Christ and you will live. Don't you want to live? Come to Christ and live. If you do, he will not disappoint. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that in Christ there is an abundance of resources and gifts and blessings and provisions to enable us to deal with the disappointments and the trouble of life. We thank you that in Christ are hidden all